Good evening, church. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Colin, the pulpit minister here at Central Church of Christ. And this is Dan Spaeth. He's one of our elders. And here at Central Church of Christ, it's our mission to be God's heart and hands in this community and beyond. If you'd like to learn more about what that means, I want to encourage you to head over to our website at www.churchvictoria.com. This is our Wednesday evening conversation through the law and the prophets where we open up the Old Testament, we move through the narrative and the text, and we see how it impacts us today as the church and how it how that text connects to Jesus. Um, if you're listening to this on the Heart and Heads podcast, I want to thank you so much for joining us. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and you have the bell turned on so you get notified every time we upload a video. And if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure to like and share. That really helps us out. And make sure to comment down below. Um, if this ministry has blessed you or you'd like to partner with us in this ministry, I want, I want to encourage you to head over to that website. At the top of the page, we have a donate button that uh, take, will take you to PayPal, and you can partner with us as we seek to teach and preach the gospel. Uh, we're going to pray and get into the lesson. Again, church, thank you so much for joining us. All right, let's pray, guys. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be together and the opportunity we have to study your powerful word. We pray your blessings upon us this evening as we study together. Help us to learn, help us to grow, and help us, Father, in each situation that we find ourselves in, uh, to be reliant and dependent on you. And thank you for the opportunity that we have to learn this, this mm. evening. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Hey, man, we're in Exodus 40. We're clicking along. We're almost done. We're, we're I, um, I mean, we, only... we thought we were going to get done last week. That didn't happen. Well, I mean, we could have. We could have, I yeah, think. Yeah, you talk too much. <laughs> I mean, another, another 10 minutes. <laughs> another 10 minutes. It <laughs> could have been 40 minutes, you know. Yeah. Long class, long class. All right, so we're in Exodus 40. Um, and, of course, what we've seen over these last few chapters since the Lord has told Moses, he's he has looked at Moses and he said, I, I'm going to forgive the sin of the golden calf. I'm going to restore the covenant. And then we've kind of continued on. He remade the tent, the uh, the tablets with the Ten Commandments mm -hmm. on them. Mm -hmm. He has instructed them how to build the tent, the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, where the Ark of the Covenant is going to go. He's taught them how to build the Ark of the Covenant. He has given them all of the designs for the priestly garments and everything like that. And we talked a lot. We went and looked at Hebrews, and we looked at how this is all a shadow looking forward into the future of of the holy place and Christ and the church. And there's a lot of really cool stuff going on here. Um, so in Exodus chapter 40, it says in verse one, then the Lord said to Moses, set up the tabernacle, the tent of meeting on the first day of the first month, place the Ark of the covenant law in it, shield the Ark with the curtain. So that'll be that, that curtain. They're going to put that Ark of the covenant in the most holy place, right? So it's, it's a big circle. Think of the, it's like a compound, a big circle. And then there's a big tent in the middle and there's an outside altar and an outside bath. But then there's this long tent and some of the priests can come into this first part of the tent. But then there's a second part to that tent that's closed off by that curtain. And there are pictures of angels and cherubim and all that stuff on it. Uh, but and that's where they're going to put the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. And so then bring in the lampstand and set it up with its lamp. Place the gold altar of incense in front of the Ark of the Covenant. Put the curtain at the entrance to the tabernacle. Place the altar of burnt offering in front of the entrance to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. Place the basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Set up the courtyard around it and put the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. So that's all stuff that we just talked about. Take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and everything in it. Consecrate it and all its furnishing, furnishings, and it will be holy. Then anoint the altar of burnt, of burnt offering and all its utensils. Consecrate the altar, and it will be most holy. Anoint the basin and its stand and consecrate them. What does it mean? They're, they're doing all of this stuff. They're anointing all of these utensils. They're anointing the altars. This is all stuff they're going to be using for all various sacrifices, for your grain offerings, for your burnt offerings, for your fellowship offering. All, what does it mean, though, to be holy? What is it? What does it actually mean? Well, you're gonna what? What it actually? You're gonna you're gonna set these these furnishings apart from all other furnishings. You're gonna do everything I tell you. You're gonna build them like I tell you, and you're gonna set them apart. And they're gonna be set apart for the Lord. So wait a minute. You're saying that holy means to set apart? Yeah, in a in a simplistic form, it means to be set apart. Does it have anything? Okay, because we're called to be holy mm -hmm. too. So does that mean when I read that God calls us to be holy as God is holy, mm -hmm. that doesn't have anything to do with goodness? It has It has everything for, of us being set apart from the world. Okay? Set apart. God's going to take us through the blood, all right? And through our, through our, through his uh, saving our lives, through, through his grace, he's going to set us apart from the world. 
and many, 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 all the writers in the New Testament, and all the, the, the letters to all the places, uh, always talked about, you know, need to eliminate this out of your life. Quit doing this. Be aliens, foreigners, strangers in a, in a perverse world. Uh, get rid of those things that attack you. Get rid of those things that attack your senses, that attack your body. Get rid of those things. So we're supposed to, we're supposed to do our part in being set apart, but God does it through the blood of his son. And he sets us apart to make us holy. And make us, and then he gives the Holy Spirit to bring all those gifts with him that uh, that help us in our weaknesses, help us when we're weak in that to, to give us to give us the ability to set ourselves apart. That's what it means. If you said if you're going to be my disciple, then you have to do what? Deny myself, pick up my cross, and follow him. The world is not following Christ, so that's going to set me apart in of itself. Just the lifestyle I'm supposed to live, but to be holy, you know. And he tells us, I think, in Second Peter, he says, "You be holy as I'm holy. You be holy." You know, this is what you ought to do. This is how you ought to live your life. And he tells us, be blameless in a, in a world that's, that's full of blame. So how is, how is God holy? If, if it means set apart, is that just, so are we just looking at God and saying, when we're saying that he is holy, is that he is set apart, that he is different, that he is no, altogether? He's, he's, a, he's, he's completely pure, com completely clean, completely, uh, uh, what's the word? Not not spotted. We don't have the count on. Oh, hey, we don't. <laughs> she's gonna have. To, she's gonna have to eliminate that, huh? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, it. It's so. If you're wondering what he was just talking about, we forgot to set the timer. Yeah, we forgot to set the timer. <laughs> I forgot. I, I looked down we. and I said, "Because we watched the timer." You know. What <laughs> I said we. I've got the remote. I forgot to set the timer. <laughs> so, yeah. The the point here is is uh, you know, God God. I don't, I don't know. I don't know exactly what you're looking so, for. So this is a. So this is the the difficult concept, right? We know the word holy means to be set aside. Mm -hmm. That they are consecrating these utensils to make them holy. That means to be set aside. We know that God calls us to be holy, which means set aside to be to foreigners in this land, to treat ourselves as foreigners, to be exiles. But then, how do we apply that to God? And I and I think really what it means for God is that he is in fact set aside and separate. He is something distinct, altogether different from the creation. God is not, so there's a, there's a different ways you can look at God. And so you, we are theists. We believe that there is, is one God, right? Uh, there are those who believe in what's called pantheism and it's the idea that <laughs> God inhabits everything. God's in the table and in the cup. And then the, we don't believe that. God spoke into existence this creation, and so he is separate from this creation. He is holy. And so there's there's a lot of different ways to look at holiness. We bring cultural baggage in when we view holiness, and we, we couple it with goodness. And it, holiness, yes, there is a goodness element to it. As you talked about, we've got to put off sin and all those things, but that's not what holiness is necessarily talking about. Um, I would say goodness is a byproduct. Of holiness, the fact that we do good things or do good works or put okay, off evil, about, but but holiness in and of itself is is uh, taking us from one from one place to another. Well, setting aside for a distinct use or purpose. So these utensils mm -hmm. have been anointed, they've been cleansed, and they will be holy, dedicated, set aside for the purpose of the Lord. Yeah, right. The Lord is That's also what I said in the beginning holy. was yes, they're set apart for the Lord's use. So, but they're, there's they're different. This table is different than that table. So there's tension though. How do we be holy? And if you ask somebody, well, how do we be holy? A lot of times we're going to answer, well, we be good. Mm -hmm. Well, the world can be good. Mm -hmm. The world is created in the image of God, just like we are created in the image of God. Well, so the my, world will exhibit good things. My job but that doesn't to, make them my holy. job uh, when God says be holy. Is to is to strive to set myself apart from the evil that's out there. Exactly. As much as I can. Well, don't just set yourself apart from the evil, right? That's something. So we look at those things and we say, I'm not going to do those things. But set yourself apart for his service as well. Mm -hmm. I while I'm not going to do that sin, I am going to do everything with thankfulness and praise to God. Mm -hmm. I am going to give God glory. <laughs> I am going to love my neighbor. I am. So there's, there's positive aspects of holiness mm -hmm. as there are negative, right? And the negative would be, I'm not going to do those things anymore. Yeah. And so both of them are true. Uh, but oftentimes our view of holiness is skewed quite a bit because we want to couple holiness with a lot of other concepts rather than looking at it for what it is. So that's why I asked that question. What does this mean to be holy? Because now all these things are holy. 
They're set aside for the distinct purpose of God, as we, Christians, should be set aside for the distinct service of God. So verse 12, bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then dress Aaron in the sacred garments, garments, anoint him and consecrate him so he may serve me as priest. Bring his sons and dress them in tunics, anoint them just as you anointed their father so they may serve me as priests. Their anointing will be to a priesthood that will continue throughout their generations. Moses did everything just as the Lord commanded him. Why was it why was it so important for for Moses to do everything just as the Lord commanded him? You know, why why in so in the New Testament we've got a lot of flexibility and freedom, right? Paul will say in Romans if you one person wants to hold a day, they'll keep it for the Lord and it's fine. And if another person wants to treat every day as the same, that's fine too, right? So there's a lot of flexibility there. Mm -hmm. Why is it so rigid here? Why does he have to anoint these priests just so? Why does he have to cleanse with? Why is he? Why does it have to be specific? You know, and this is the very similar. I think. I think right. he's. I think he's. He's a, everything that God is doing here. He's pointing us to us. He's pointing us to Christ. Right. You know. He's pointing us so that we understand that God has a way of doing things through this covenant, mm. but the other covenant. You won't understand the new covenant if you don't understand this covenant. If this covenant doesn't, if he doesn't do it this way, how are you going to understand the difference between the other covenant and this covenant? How are you going to understand the difference between the way God deals with the other covenant and the way he deals with this covenant? This is a physical, hands-on, you know, God working overtime in this covenant. Always involved. Guys are doing this. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. I want you to do this. I want you to consecrate this. This has got to be holy this way. You've got to build this thing this way. You've got to build this thing that way. And then Jesus comes along. Does all the work, okay? Does all the work, and it's a spiritual covenant. So, what are they working? What are what are they working against, right? What are they consecrating themselves from? Why do they have to take the shower and put the anointing oil on and do all? What are they cleansing themselves from? From from, from sin. And that's the point of the law. Yes. Paul says in Galatians, right? The point of the law was to be a tutor to, to lead a us, school, school teacher, bring us to the so, bring us to the truth. So, what are we learning here? We're learning that we've got a big sin problem. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, that's essentially what we're seeing. That and God's going to deal with it here physically. Yes. He's going to deal with it with us spiritually. It's different. It's That's why it's a different covenant in Jeremiah. He tells us it's going to be a new covenant, a different covenant. It's going to be found on different promises. You know, it's going to be, it, you know, I'm not only going to forgive, I'm going to forget. You know, here, that's not the way it works here. Here, he can forgive sins, but he's going to always re be reminded of it every year. We have to do the same thing. The guy have to do the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah. It's never going to stop. They're never going to be able to cleanse Aaron, wash him with water one time. It's already good. Every time he goes into that place, he's got to wash with water and put his clothes on. And him and all of his sons all and all sons. the generations all yeah. throughout Israel, there's this buildup of sin. And that's so important to get because we're about to get into Leviticus. Yeah. And Leviticus is going to deal with sin and deal with the consequences of sin. And there's going to be a lot of <laughs> offerings dealing with it. That, I mean, and everything is going to need to be cleansed. We're going to see that once a year, they take blood and they throw it on the altar. They throw it at the foot of the, the base of the altar to cleanse the altar from the buildup of wickedness and sin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's absolutely, I would say that in the 21st century, at least my generation, you know, I'm not, I'm not a boomer, so I don't see things. We've talked about how we don't see things necessarily the same, but I would say as a millennial, my generation probably lacks the understanding of just how horrific and horrible sin is and the stain that wrongdoing causes mm -hmm. right i would say i would say my generation probably lacks the lacks an understanding of that it's almost like shame and we've talked about before how it our our society doesn't have a sense of shame anymore um sin well, is it's it, it's the, your generation has been taught to think different mm-hmm Y'all think more introspect in, internally, all right? You think more, uh, I don't know, it's hard to explain. I, I, I know uh, there is a, a lot of times there's what I call common sense. There's a, a lack of common sense when it comes to people who, who have been trained to think that way. And so it's only natural that you would look at the, some principles and precepts from the book and not quite understand them not see them the same way that I might see them from. Sure. You know, and so for me as a teacher, it's I've got to remember that when I'm teaching people because they may not see it the same way. And so I've got to try to teach it a different way. And and here, you know, when you look at these things and you say, you know, I don't understand this, it's perfectly clear to me what's going on here. But I know the book. 
It's perfectly clear what, what's happening here with Hebrews and Romans and, and, all, and Galatians. It's perfectly clear to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can think my way through it. And sometimes I, I find people can't do that. Yeah. Uh, and, and for that reason, you know, you're looking at it and saying, uh, we don't have a real concept of the stain of sin. Uh, I think you're probably right. You know, there's certain the younger generation doesn't. No. They don't see, you know, because they've been they've been uh, uh, not brainwashed, but they've been they've been taught that I'm my own person. I don't need anybody else. That kind of thing. Well, and even like this past Sunday, right? So I just preached on, you know, and he'll punish on the on the Exodus 34, 6 and 7. And I got to that last part. You know, he's going to punish the sins of the fathers on the children up to the third and fourth generation. And you look at that statement and it's abhorrent. Uh -huh. It's abhorrent because, you know, as you said, we're individuals. Mm -hmm. So nobody should suffer for my sin. But that's just not true. People suffer for other people's sin or other people's wrongdoing or other people's cr criminal activity all the time. Yeah. All the time. You know, and the, the analogy I used in the sermon was if I go rob a bank and get shot, my family's going to have to deal with the consequences of my sin. They didn't do anything, but they're going to suffer. I'm going to be gone, right? They're going to have to suffer with the shame of what I've done. Right. They're going to have to they're going to now have to my wife's going to figure out how to manage five kids on her own. Right. So they're going to suffer quite a bit for my actions. Yeah. And that's something I would say that that millennials and younger don't don't really grab on to. Right. Yeah, I think I think they I, I think a lot of times people can't grasp the 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 consequences of, of their actions. Sure. And it's uh, it's it's sad because I can look at it and say, I know exactly what's coming. Mm hmm. You know, but I knew that even when I was 10, because that's the way we were taught. You do this, this is going to happen. Period. All right. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to stand you in the corner. I'm not going to take away your laptop. I'm going to clock you. <laughs> you know? Right. And I knew, you know, I knew. Well, now, I'm not saying that was the right thing to do. I'm just saying that, you know, that there was... A, uh, we'd learned early on. Well, you also knew that if you went out and made a fool of yourself, that would reflect on your family. Mm -hmm. You also knew that I can't just go out and do whatever I want because that's going to come back and bite the community in the butt. Yeah. Right. It's going to it's going to have more impact than just yeah. me. There were still people in my generation didn't care. They didn't care. Yeah. They're going to do what they're going to do. See, ultimately, it's your generation's fault. So I blame you. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably all our fault. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I mean, I looked at <laughs> I looked at it from a. I'm looking at it from this perspective, and you know, I think the way I was trained, the way I was taught, was the reason that I came to the Lord. The reason I I was able to grasp some of the things that I was looking at, you know. And as I learned all this stuff, and I learned, you know, I read this, and it's really simple to me because, but um, you know, I'm I'm thinking of of text in Hebrews and Romans and Galatians and different places. I'm First Peter, th Second First John, those kind of things. I'm looking at, and I'm seeing it very clearly, mm -hmm. and and I know that our audience. You know, that we're trying to help them to, to see that. that. That's, you know, we're not trying to make it too simplistic, but we want you to understand, you know, it is very simple. God's dealing with them from a physical perspective. Well, and sin has, sin is a big deal. It is a big deal. It is a big deal. It, it big stains deal. you. There's a lot of, especially in this covenant before Christ, there's a lot of work that goes involved. They're constantly cleansing themselves. They're constantly, why? Because they're in the presence of God. Yeah. And it's like being in the sun. And the know? beauty of this is, is I can go into the presence of God every day. I don't have Christ. a curtain in, in my way. I can go because of what Jesus did. Right. Not because of anything I've done, because of what he did. And I think that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's God telling them how to do this. Why? Because God wants them in his presence. Yes. God wants people in his presence, but we've got to deal with sin. Yeah. And so this is how, under this covenant, how they dealt with sin. And it was to help teach them and prep them right? That sin is a problem that's going to have to be yeah. dealt with. Yeah. And I've got one coming who's going to deal with it. Yeah. You are incapable. These little things you do, you're going to have to do over and over and over and over and over again, mm -hmm. because as you said, it's going to keep yeah. building up, yeah. right? So the, even the priests who are supposed to be a priest is someone who is 
God to the people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it is the representative of the people to God. That's who the priests are, right? So the yeah. tabernacle was set up on the first day of the first month. This is verse 17 in Exodus 40. So the tabernacle was set up on the first day of the first month in the second year. When Moses set up the tabernacle, he put the bases in place, erected the frames, inserted the crossbars, and set up the posts. Then he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering over the tent as the Lord commanded him. He took the tablets of the covenant law and placed them in the ark, attached the poles to the ark, and put the atonement cover over it. Then he brought the ark into the tabernacle and hung the shield and curtain and shielded the ark of the covenant of the law as the Lord commanded him. Moses placed the table in the tent of meeting. He's getting the tent set up. Mm -hmm. If you've ever set up a camp, mm -hmm. that's what he's doing. He's setting this tent up just as God has said. Yep. Um, and he and that's and that's going to continue. He places the basin in verse thirty between the tent of the meeting and the altar, and put the water in it for the washing. And Moses and and his and Aaron and his sons used it to wash their hands and their feet. They washed whenever they entered the tent of the meeting or approached the altar, as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and the altar, and put the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. So everything the Lord had said concerning the tent, the tabernacle, mm -hmm. the compound as it is, yep. all of those things was set up. And this is detailed work. Yes. This isn't just hodgepodge. This is, there's a lot of stuff going into this. There's a lot of details. They're going to have to do things just the right way. We're going to see that some people don't do things just the right way. We're going to see some people in Leviticus who just decided, well, we're going to do whatever we want yep. mm -hmm. and waltz into the presence of God. And we're going to see that that's, that's not going to work out very well for them. But in verse 34, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. This is the cloud. This is God mm -hmm. who has been leading these people around. The cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Verse 35 is very important because this is going to explain Leviticus. Okay. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses can't go in because God's in there now. Mm -hmm. Why? Moses sat up on the mountaintop with them, mm -hmm. and he was just fine. But now Moses comes back down. He involves himself with his people who have broken covenant, and he can't enter the tent of meeting because he's not clean. Because he's not because God is holy, and he and he is not at that point. The only one that can go in there is who? Nobody. Nobody. But can only the ones that are going to be able to go in there once that is the priest, and God's already said that Moses is not one. Moses will be able to re-enter the tent, but yeah. right now, yeah. The covenant is broken. All the covenant is broken. The, the covenant is still... God has said in Exodus 34, I'm going to fix this covenant. Mm -hmm. I'm going to restore it. But he hasn't done it yet. Mm -hmm. This is another aspect. When does he do it? Leviticus 9. 9. And Nadab and Abihu are Leviticus 10. Yeah. So understand. See, we, we oftentimes want to look at Nadab and Abihu and say, see, see, see. Mm -hmm. If you don't do things exactly as the yep. Lord says, see mm -hmm. what happens. Mm -hmm. And we're missing the point of Nadab and Abihu. The story of Nadab and Abihu is not just they did, they did, they did, they took a wrong step. Mm -hmm. The story of Nadab and Abihu is on the day that God is restoring covenant with Israel, yeah. they, probably because they were drunk, walked into the most holy of holies of most holy of holies. They were the wrong people at the wrong time with the wrong offering on one of them the, on what is probably the most sacred day of Israel. They did what was good in their own eyes as priests of yeah. the Lord. I mean, this is a huge deal. And uh, Nadab and Abihu are going to pay the cost. Of course, we'll get there in Leviticus chapter 10. But, but it's important to see what's going on here. Moses should be able to enter in. He should be able to go in and talk to God because he is a special servant to God, yeah. right? Aaron and Miriam later in Leviticus, I believe it's Leviticus, will say, who is is it Numbers or Leviticus they do that? I can't, I can't, now I'm, now I'm doubting myself. Anyway, there will come a point where Aaron and Miriam will rebel and they will say, we're just as good as, Oh yeah, I remember. we're just yep. as good mm -hmm. as Moses. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. God's going to come down and say, no, Moses is, is special. He's, he's a friend, right? We speak face to face, right? And so Moses is, should be able to enter into the tent here, but he can't because the people, the covenant has been broken. So we've got, God's got to restore the covenant. And that's going to happen in Leviticus now, 9. You know, something we need to clear up here, okay? Or just make clear. This is a tent because they are wandering. Yes. Yes. There, There is no permanent structure because they are still wandering. And God knows that, I mean, they're only, what, three, four months into this thing? 
By the time they finish this, oh, and they're then, a little. No, I'm not. I'm talking about when this starts. Oh, when it starts, yeah, it's this, a couple months. Couple months. Yes, they haven't started the wandering. They're gonna they're gonna come to the promised land in about two years. So the first time, the first time. When this occurs, when the glory of the Lord fills that, when they're done doing all this, it's I believe about eighteen months. Okay, it's been about eighteen months. They're gonna spend the rest of that time. Uh, up so they're going to spend the next six months getting to the land. Yeah. Right. They're w going through the desert, getting to the yeah. land, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, and then if I remember, it's about the time two line, years right? altogether from years. time of leaving Egypt until the time they get to the promised land the first time. Yes. In that process, there is a there is a time where they are stopped and they're building this tent. That's and putting all this together. Yeah. That's what they're doing. They're getting a tabernacle, a place for God to dwell, a place in their midst where they will be the center of their lives. Yes. It, it takes them. It takes about two months to get to Sinai, to Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. From Egypt, and then they're at Sinai for about eighteen months, yeah, yeah, a year and a half, yeah, and then so all together that puts it at twenty months, and then they're going to spend some time getting to the land and fighting some of the nations right outside the land mm -hmm. and dealing with some of that stuff, and then they're gonna then they're gonna deny going into the land and they're gonna come back yeah. out. So if you numbers, technically they do not leave. Okay, uh -huh. they do not leave Mount Sinai. Numbers, Numbers chapter eleven is when they leave Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. So they're still at Mount Sinai right now. Yeah. So they're still there. Um, all in Leviticus, they're going to be at, at the foot of Mount Sinai. Numbers chapter 11 is the first time they leave Mount Sinai. And it gives us a date. Um, it gives us a timestamp for figuring out the time, how the timetable worked. Yeah. But it's hard to keep, in tra keep track of because we've just walked through in Exodus, at the end of Exodus, we just walked through about five or six chapters of legalese. Yeah. And we did that about the middle of Exodus. Well, you know, I think, I think, and, and time... You know, just just for clarification for for our audiences, is, is that you know that this is this is all while they're at Sinai. This is they're getting this ready. God is preparing them yes. for a journey. Mm -hmm. Okay, and He's preparing them for a fight. Yeah, because they're fixing to go into the Promised Land. You know that that's the goal. They're not going to, but that's the goal. Yes, and and this this Ark, this Tabernacle, all of these furnishings, all of this is going to be the center. It's like you said, a big circle, and in the center is going to be this long tent with all these partitions, all these places in it, with all these furnishings in it, and it's going to be where they serve God for the people. This is where the people will bring their, their concerns, and this is where they'll do the sacrificing. This is where they'll offer blood. This is where all of that will be done at, at this tabernacle, at this place. It's uh, it Later on, in 1 Kings chapter 8, is where Solomon is going to dedicate the temple. It is going to be the first time a permanent structure is built to to uh, mimic this tabernacle. Yes, that's what it's going to do. And if all the same places yeah. inside of it as this tabernacle does, they use the tabernacle all the way until then. David wants to build a temple. Well, and they don't use it appropriately, and we're going no, to see that. No, they don't no. use it appropriately. They're going to end up splitting up the Ark of the Covenant and the Tabernacle. They're going to end up doing some things that they shouldn't do. They're going to end up go having high places again. They're going to end up doing some things that the law says that they shouldn't do. And what we're going to see is God is very patient with them. Yeah. Um, They're going to do a lot of stuff that they shouldn't do. Right. You know, and, and when David wants to build a temple, God says, no, you can't. You've got blood on your hands. Well, and, and what's what's got one of the part of that rebuke, too, with David that we're going to see from Nathan, uh, well, from the Lord through Nathan, Nathan is that uh, you, you're going to build a, a house for God. Where does he dwell? You know, heaven is his throne and the earth well, is his footstool. And, and in First Kings, <laughs> in First Kings, I, I want to read it. I was looking for it. It says uh, in verse chapter eight, verse 27, it says, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain him. How much less the temple I have built. Now Solomon, in his prayer of dedication, is he says, I can't believe that God's going to live here. Okay, I can't believe it. Well, right here in this place, what happens? It says the glory of God came down and filled the tabernacle. Right. Can you imagine? I, th I thought about that when I read it earlier. I thought, can you imagine what these people thought when they saw that? Moses tries to go in, he can't go in. You know, mo nobody can go in, and this, this, and it, and it doesn't just say that. Listen to what it said: Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Listen to it. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day, and the fire was in the cloud by night, in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travel. You know, you would think 
this would stop them from building a calf. You would think this would stop them from being stupid. Well, and it, it really goes back to what I've said multiple times. I've heard, I've talked to, you know, a lot of people who are not Christians. And, you know, the, the constant thing I hear, the constant, the, the one constant thing that always comes up is this. If God is real, why doesn't he set up on a mountaintop somewhere? Because then nobody would doubt him and everybody would follow. And that's... They did, they did that, and I pointed out every time, he's been there, he's done that. And what we find is people are going to do whatever they want to do, regardless. No matter, what, no matter what. Regardless. No matter. Adam and Eve walked in the garden with God. God literally told them, you eat this fruit, you're going to die. Don't eat the fruit. And what did Eve do? First chance she got, she exactly. said, she said, hey, I think that looks good. It's interesting. If you go back and read Genesis 1 through 3, look at all the things that are good just in the text that the characters say. God says, what I'm doing is good. This is good. This is good. This is good. And then he says, hey, that fruit, eh, that's bad. That's going to kill you. And Eve looks at the thing that's going to kill her and she says, ah, that's good. And that's mankind. Yeah. That's what we do. We have God right there. The whole time, God's right there saying, hey, that's not good. That's poison. Bad. Don't touch. And we go, <laughs> no, no, no. That's good. <laughs> yeah. And we do it. And they're doing it here. That's what the golden calf was. The golden calf was God's up on the mountain saying, this is what's good. And the people are looking at him going, no, that's good. Yeah. So it's 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 just a repeated thing. People are going to do what what the scriptures really teach us about man is that man is going to do what's good in his own eyes, regardless of what God says. Yeah. So there are very few people who are going to look at this world and go, you know, I don't know my right from my left. God, you 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 know what's best. I'm going to follow you. You would think with this cloud and this fire constantly around them, the Israelites would go do this. I don't got nothing to worry about. Yeah. I got nothing to worry about. God's going to take care of everything. Obviously, he's right there. I mean, look, he's right there. And when he's not right there, we get up and we march. And when he is right there, we stop. I don't have to, what, what I have to worry about. The bread just shows up on the ground. You know, Bob got upset about the bread and he brought quail. He brought so much quail that it was coming out of our ears and our nose. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, what do we, we want water? It comes out of a rock. Yeah. What, what, what is the concern here? But yet what we see again and again and again is these people want to go back to Egypt. And, you know, and, I, and I, I, I got a note here that I wrote down a while ago. It says, you know, it came and covered the tent of meeting. This is basically their, uh, uh, their temple. It's what it is. Oh, it's yeah. their temple. It's a it's a, a movable temple. Yes. Not a not a fixed base structure. No. But it is where God dwells. Yes. In the and, midst of his people. And first Corinthians chapter sixteen says, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? Mm. And that God's spirit dwells in your midst. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. We're God's temple. Jesus, you know, it's everything here is pointing us to the fact that we are in a relationship with God. I had that opportunity to be in a relationship with God, and God will make his dwelling with us. The community is the temple. Yes. The community. Mm -hmm. How many times have you heard, well, I'm just going to go do church by myself? You can't do that. Can't do that. Because, that. because that's not the way God designed it. They couldn't do it either. They couldn't go off somewhere and do church by themselves. They couldn't. No. You know, you don't think some of them said, I think I'll go back to Egypt by myself. What happens? They go back. They're going to they're going to be destroyed. There's no food. There's no water. And there's no hope of finding their way back. Because God's leading them. God's feeding them. God's watering them. So if you go off by yourself, what's going to happen? You're going to get lost. You're going to get thirsty. And you're going to get hungry. And you're going to die. What happens today? If, if God's taking care of us, he's leading us. Jesus said, follow me. He said, I am the bread of life. I, you want, you thirsty, drink from me. So if I decide to go off by myself, man, this could make, this could preach, couldn't it? You're going to go off by yourself. You're going to, you're going to abandon the, the directional map that you have through him. You're going to abandon the one that gives you water and you abandon the one that gives you food. What happens? You die. You're going to die. Same thing that happened to them would happen to us. That's why you can't do it by yourself. Well, and, it, and it's, it's not just natural consequences are going to kill you. I mean, I, I do, that is true. If the Christian goes off and wanders off by himself and refuses to, to, to mm -hmm. participate with the community, that is what's going to happen, right? The wolves will come. They'll make a shipwreck of his faith. They'll destroy him. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's even worse than that because you're not just going to have the enemy against you. God says in 1 John, if you don't love the church, if you don't love my people, you don't love me. Bad deal. 
Because how can you love God who you haven't seen when you hate his children yeah. who you have seen? Yeah. And so now that's a paraphrase, but the point of it is very simple. I understand. You go off on your own, not only is the world going to eat you up and spit you out, but if you try to stay there, your well, faith is well, not pleasing to yeah, God. Go out without, you know, and sometimes, you know, we, we just look at words on a page and it's more than that. Mm -hmm. You know, what kind of enemies did, did they experience on the way? Oh man! As they were well, going, talking about? two million people, right? Yeah. I'm not talking about phys I'm not talking about human enemies. What mm. about all the animals that were there? All the snakes that were out there? All the, you know, I mean, you know, I've been to Zapata before. Mm -hmm. You know, now I'm not I'm not criticizing anybody that lives in Zapata, but there ain't nothing out there except everything out there will stick you, stab you, or bite you. That's pretty true. You walk through the wilderness out there. That's true of a lot of Texas, though. <laughs> <laughs> but but I've been in Zapata and you know and and I when I was driving through there I'm going you know of course you know it was you know I was uh, under the influence when we went mm -hmm. come back and mm -hmm. and we I was talking with a guy that I was with and, and I said you know what I would hate to be stranded out and out there and he and he looked at me he said man he said Dan you have no idea because he 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 knew that area and he said everything out there will stick you stab you or bite you. And he said, you can't survive out there on your own. That's why people that cross the border, they many times they die out there. Yeah. Because it's so, it's so uh uh it's so detrimental to health. You know, these guys are wandering through a wilderness, through the desert. They have they've been in bondage for four hundred years. Their their whole history, everything they've been taught as children, as you know, you're talking about millennials think different. <laughs> these people were taught how to be slaves. They they only know someone taking care of them. They go off by themselves. Man, we got to get to that point. We got to get to the point where we become slaves of God. Because we don't, and we don't get that mindset, we're going to go out in the wilderness, and the enemy's going to eat us, man. Something out there is going to stick us, it's going to stab us, or it's going to bite us. And that's just a fact. We are the temple of God. Together as a unit, we are God's temple, his holy place, place where he gets things done. Going he's going he's gonna to lead us, yeah. he's going to water us, and he's going to feed us. That's right. And he's going to save us. He's going to protect us. All those things he's going to do for us. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So we're going to be in Leviticus. Finally. <laughs> finally. We were just as tired of Exodus as you guys were of hearing. Oh, I'm, sure. I, no, I, I, hey, it was good. No, it was good. It was good. But I was ready, I, I was ready to be done. And, and, there's, and you look at, if you've read Leviticus, you think, God, what are they going to do with this? Man? So yeah, Leviticus is fun because it's 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 going to be interesting because you know have you ever have you ever started one of those you read the Bible in a year plan? Oh yeah, you Leviticus is the place that people that's where die. most that's, people that's, die. That's, that's where, where people, they die. Yeah, that's where yeah. that's where it's people, like people like, go to the to the graveyard of Bible <laughs> reading and like Leviticus. Leviticus yeah. That's where they stop. All right, let's pray, man. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you so much for being our God and for showing us uh, how this path uh, unfolded. Father, we, uh, we understand in the, in the new system, the new covenant, we have uh, access to you through your son. And we thank you for that. We have access to, to freedom and holiness through, the, through his blood that he shed on the cross. Uh, we, are, we are inundated by his grace, by your grace and your mercy. And it's, it's fun to watch and see how this is going gonna, gonna to transpire and how it's going to get to that through what you do with these people. Thank you, Father, for all of this. Thank you for the information that we have that we can look at and we can learn and we can see clearly uh, what it is that you are doing and how you're going to incorporate it down the road with us. Thank you, Father, for that. Bless us. Help us to be the people that your son died to make us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.